Why, hello there. It's me, Jeremy, your favorite bald dude telling you about Standard and Strange, a store and a brand with simple rules. Sell clothes they themselves would wear, manufacture it ethically, and build it to last. From boots made in Oregon to loop wheel garments made in Japan, find all the best clothes for your wardrobe at Standard and Strange. Standardandstrange.com. Hey folks, it's Blamo. I'm Jeremy Kirkland. La di da. Big pod this week, the pod of pods with Yolanda Edwards, the queen of travel. For real, uh, I first met Yolanda a few years ago via her husband, Matt Hrennick of W. Brown. It's been on the pod before. They've actually both been on the pod before, but uh, nothing with just Yolanda. And look, for sure, I've admired her work for a long time. And a heads up, this was a heavy pod at times. Uh, we discussed family, life, rant about travel. We, we get pretty deep. I, I actually don't know how we got there, but we did. I'm very grateful for it. But let this pod serve as a reason to, to talk to people. Like, I'm just going to go through this. Like, when I first met Yolanda, I was like, wow, she's so cool. I bet she doesn't like me. <laughs> Which, look, look, I've been in enough therapy now to know, like, that's not the vibe. But, I mean... She has such incredible taste when you look at not just YOLO Journal or the stuff that she's made with, with Condé Nast, but there's, there's a very, there's a warmth to her images. There's a warmth to her writing, her recommendations. It's, it's really beautiful. And we, we get into it. We, we run the full gauntlet on this. <laughs> Yolanda discusses her life and love of travel, how to do it right, what hotels are overrated, how to get an apartment abroad, and newsletters versus magazines. We hit all the stops. Let's go. If it sounds like we've been chatting for a while, it's because we have, because I just got my wonderful therapy lesson, th- therapy <laughs> session, excuse me, with you. Uh, I, I, I might have forgotten you also double as a, as a life coach. I think, I think that might be the next uh, phase for me. <laughs> yeah. um, but we were, we were chatting earlier. I think f- for me, like one of the things, you know, the many things I want to chat with you about today is kind of like the, the career ascent, but also the rebirth because you have been in the publishing industry for a long time, but you launched multiple outlets from YOLO Journal to your Substack, which is incredible, but also all of these travel guides. So you've done interviews in the past, you know, you've talked about where you're from, but if you could humor me for a little bit, you grew up in, you said Tacoma? Yeah. So I, I grew up in Tacoma. I was born in Clovis, New Mexico, um, to a very young mother who was not, uh, married to anybody. Okay. And so we sort of went back to her hometown of Tacoma and, um, we, for the first two years in Tacoma, my mom was just sort of like, that's where she's from. So she had her parents there. And then she met my dad in church. And my mom was in church because she was like a young mother who like in 1970, Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. was, you know, it wasn't really like the thing to be a single mom. And my dad started going to church because he was drafted for Vietnam and was afraid he was going to die. So they both were like these sort of desperate characters who um, were looking for structure, guidance, eternal life. And that's how they ended up meeting each other, singing songs at a senior citizen's home. Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. Yeah. What kind of mood is that in a childhood where you have two parents that are claiming, or not, not claiming, sorry, like searching for life and longevity? Here's the, there's so much stuff to talk about, but something that I think is a theme that I've experienced more than ever is being an adult and realizing that adults don't know everything. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But like growing up thinking that they do and then being angry about how like you feel that you got sort of short shrift on something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I've been mad so much of my life at them. And then I finally went back to Washington State a couple of weeks ago and I like slipped into their world. I didn't have Matt with me. I was just like, I'm going to stay in your house. I'm going to like be in your world. 
I'm going to let you read the Bible as much as you want to. I'm going to just like be in it with you. And it was like this amazing experience where I like, I was like, I'm not mad anymore. Like I finally am able to see them like they were just like the way we fuck up. They fucked up too. Like, and they're just, they're, they're just living their life. And I happen to be the child that was in it, you know, but, but I think that the, anger that came from being a kid growing up like that is what fueled it is what fuels us to be who we are as adults right we yeah you white knuckle success yeah you sort of like are in you define who you are i mean of course we are who we are in some space like before we start to say you know, we, we start getting influences from people and the things that surround us. Right, right. And if they are the things that surround us and you don't like it, then you become in reactive mode. And I think that that's, you know, a big part of my like travel, wanting to be around beautiful things, eating like a, in a certain way, like all of the stuff that I care about is I think very much in reaction to like, I didn't grow up with any of that. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's obviously like a lot to process, but like when, you know, so you grow up in this house you said your mom was a piano teacher? My dad. Your dad was a piano mm-hmm. teacher. And when, you know, how, what were like vacations like, or were there vacations? Like what was the love for traveling, the new experiences, or it was the desire to es- not escape, but maybe depart mm-hmm. from a current situation? I think that the, the first kind of travel that we did that I could say made some sort of impact on me was, I mean, really vacations were like, going from Washington State, driving down the I-5 to California, where my dad is from. Mm -hmm. So we would go Tacoma down to Burlingame in the Mm -hmm. Bay Area. And it's like a, I don't know, 800 mile drive. So we'd break it up. But I would always beg, like, can we please stay at like one of those motels that has a pool? And you'd see sort of like the neon signs and the then the pool could be glowing. And like if he, if they would say like, yes, we, we can spring for it and, and do that instead of like staying at some aunt in Medford's house. <laughs> then we like go there and then there would be things that would happen that would never happen in real life. Like my parents were so anti-sugar. They were just like, they were kind of like Christian hippies. Ooh. So we would. That's, that's coming back right now. Oh. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> we're always ahead. Yeah. Um, those Edwards. Um, but it would be like, can I get a soda from the machine? And so like, yes, you can get the lemonade. And then like that kind of like clunk clunk of like the machine, like dropping the lemonade, you know, and just like that would never have happened. So like the idea that being on the road means you get something that you never get in your everyday life started there. So I think like, even though they weren't vacations per se, like I know we went camping, but I didn't like camping. So for me, it was like, whatever about that lake. Like, I have big trauma for my dad. Why am I sleeping in (laughs) the grass? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I think there was a bear one time. And, you know, yeah, it was like one time there was a lake and we, um, my dad tried to make me learn how to swim, was traumatized for years from that. You know, so lots of, the, the only romance I have from a young age of travel is like the motel, the pool, the swimming in a heated pool, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, And then I would say that the the travel kind of like in my trying to find something other than the life that I was given by my parents was like, I I must have been in high school and I would go to the international. By this time, we'd moved down to Burlingame. So I'd go to the International Cafe that was in San Mateo on 3rd Avenue, and it had like this great magazine section. And I'd look at all these magazines, like if, you know, I had money for my paper route, and then I started teaching piano. So I'd like buy stuff. Wait, 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 hold on. Money from paper route? When did you get a job? Um, I had a paper route from when I was 10. So that was my first job. What, I've been working ever since I was 10. What made you want to get a job at 10? Um, mon- <gasps> money. <laughs> yeah, money. <laughs> money. I just wanted stuff. Like, I wanted sure. candy. Yep. I wanted hostess fruit pies. 
I wanted all the things that I couldn't get. Um, my mom made me like sprout and avocado sandwiches. Like that was embarrassing and terrible. I wanted She like, was so ahead of the game. You were plant-based before it was cool. Totally. But it was so horrible for me. I was like, ugh, <laughs> what? Like, why can't I have like a bologna I want sandwich? Processed foods. I want processed foods. Yeah. And so I would I knew I needed to make money so that I could actually buy the stuff that I wanted. So it was like I'd go on my paper route, mm-hmm. get my money, stop at Lucky's, the grocery store, get myself a hostess fruit pie. I had to eat eat it like like shove it in my face while I was on the paper route because I couldn't have it at home. Oh, no yeah. evidence. Trust me, I know exactly what you're talking about. I did yeah. this. But then I'd like take all the candy and shove it like a squirrel or a chipmunk or whatever into I made holes in my jacket in my parka. So like I could push it in the back. And then like when I needed it, like that was my secret stash. Oh my God. There was a gas station near me when I was younger and I would go there and they also had, I, I think this concept's like kind of novel now, but they had like day old, mm. you know? Oh, and so yeah. you could go to like the discount bakery and it was like day old fruit pies, mm. day old like snack cakes and Oh, I mean, the memories are so good <laughs> of me just like jamming multiple oatmeal cream pies into my mouth. So I could like win the day as I oh, came yeah. home to beans and cornbread. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, my mom was like, it was like stir fry with brown rice. It was kind of dinner. Unbelievable yeah. food. Yeah. So, okay. So you had the paper out and then you were teaching piano? Yeah. So my dad taught me how to teach piano and he was like... You said taught you how to teach. Yeah. Because like, you know, you can be a, you can be a pianist, but to learn how to teach... It's mm-hmm. he sort of like set me up with like here are the here are the books here's mm-hmm. like here's how you sort of the the first you know the first kind of lessons like what you do and then it just becomes Middle instinctive. C sort of stuff yeah yeah okay but then um, <laughs> I had also because like on Saturdays he would teach piano he would bring me along and I think he thought he was giving my mom a break but what he was doing was he didn't know this but he was exposing me to the way other people live and so I would go into these other people's homes and like they'd say oh, do you want to have, you know, some breakfast? Like maybe it was two kids having lessons back to back. So I would be there for an hour, hour and a half. And then do you want to watch cartoons? Oh my God. Yes. We didn't have TV. So I was like television. These people have like nice furniture. The food in their house is great. There's junk food. They have cool cars. Like, like, this is like styled out in a way mm-hmm. I have never seen. Like we we grew up with like furniture that was hand me downs from family or sure. yeah, yeah. whatever. Like I would never want anybody to come to our house. Like at a certain point, then like I started finding friends who I don't know. I just gravitated to the people who had nice. Their parents had nice things. I don't. I mean, now I'm like. Was I a grifter from a young age? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think, yeah. And there's, well, there's a curiosity, yeah. right? That's natural yeah. at that age too, where you realize that people, not everyone lives the same way you do. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I would say the the piano teaching, I learned how, you know, my dad started giving me students that were like the the kids of his, um, the siblings of his students, um, or like he would just pass the entire family off to me. And so it was a really good good income. At a certain point in high school, I said, um, if I, cause he wanted to offer to me and my brother that take we over the do, family business. He wanted us to do homeschooling and his, his whole oh. thing. I know his intention was homeschooling will be great for the kids because we'll make sure that they aren't around all the sinners out there. Oh. Um, <laughs> Only the sinners at home. Yeah. But like, basically, I can protect them from the inevitable and then maybe they'll end up going to like a Christian school or something like that. And um, you must have rebelled real hard when you got out. Oh, my God. (laughs) I was rebelling from age five. Okay. I was I was always like that kid who was like Here's your fucking paper route. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like I'm 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 on my own path here. And so um I uh I was like, yeah, I'll do homeschooling because yeah. then I can teach piano more, make more money because I 
I could start at like two thirty with the little kids who mm-hmm. who got out of school sooner, and then um, and then I would also be the mom that my friends would call from the nurse's office, and they'd be like, "Mom, I'm not feeling well." I'm like, "Okay, honey, put the nurse on." It was like, "Hi, this is Mrs. Javer. Um, yes, I'll be picking up Bruce." And then I'd go pick up Bruce and we'd head off to Half Moon Bay and I'd like, you know, he'd go surfing and I would just like sit there and I I couldn't be on my phone then. What was I doing? (laughs) I don't even know. What do we do? Yeah. Look at the sky. Yeah, I I couldn't Instagram it. I I couldn't like, you know, catch up on emails. (laughs) (laughs) But basically that was my, I was just super rebellious, but also like, I think I was just studying other ways of living. So it was like um, immersing myself in like fashion. I loved like, I'd go to Salvation Army. I'd find ways to put together outfits that looked like what I saw in those magazines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'd go, um, I'd save money, go to Macy's, buy like stuff that was at 70% off. It was like a Ralph Lauren um, silk blouse with like B blows pants. Wow. Yeah, fancy. And then wear it to the club. I I clubbed a lot. I was really big in clubbing. Okay, so the rebellions, are we at peak rebellion yet? Uh, This is probably peak rebellion. Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like I was. Have I was, you moved out, or are you? No, this no. Is, oh, I'm still COVID living at home. Peak rebellion. Yeah, okay. and, and like I would, I was a huge liar. I was a <laughs> masterful liar. <laughs> at a certain point, when I got out of high school, I was like, I remembered. I couldn't. I couldn't remember the lie anymore. I, I was like, it's too hard to remember the lies. Oh, I believe the word is pathological now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Uh, and so I I just was like, stop lying. Like, it doesn't matter anymore. Like, just tell the truth. And just, but, I mean, I still had to lie about like when I had boyfriends and like, I just, my parents like never wanted me to be, you know, like moving in with a guy or so sure. like those were things that I still lied about. Even when I met Matt, I had... um Matt had like one of those answering machines where you could be like, um, or Matt, press one. For Yolanda, press two. Oh. And so I pretended that he had like another apartment and that I wasn't actually like sleeping in the same bedroom as he was. So my, I was like, yeah, so if I've moved into Matt's building and we share this phone line. Um, we skipped then, ahead a few years. How old yeah. are you at this age? Oh, that was like 27. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, just sticking with the lying thing. Yeah. I, I kind of stopped lying except for anything around boys. Okay. Boys to men. So you so you have all these jobs. You're, you're learning and experiencing different perspectives on mm-hmm. life through yes. various cultures and individuals. Yeah. Understanding what wealth is without actually experiencing it. Right. And then you what? You you homeschool and then you you went to college. Yeah, I went to I went to college. Um just to back up a little on that sure. sort yeah, of yeah. influence kind of thing. Like I had t- I had two families that I would say sort of like were the biggest influences. One was the this family, the McKinleys. They they had they were watch collectors they were car collectors oh wow and they were travelers and so they were like and they had a swimming pool that had a jacuzzi that like had a waterfall into the pool wow that was whoa yeah. i was like they have arrived they are the coolest so they were the first people who invited me to europe and I said to my parents, like, I'm going to go meet them. They need On to- like their family vacation. Yeah. And they said, we're going to be in Egypt and then we'll meet you in <laughs> Athens. <laughs> so, yeah. They were fancy. Okay. I was like, Egypt. Clearly. Yeah. Egypt. Like, I this know. This isn't, let's go see the Colosseum. Yeah. And we're going so, to the pyramids. So they, but they said, <laughs> we're doing that on our family trip, but we'll meet you in Athens. And then from Athens, we'll go to Mykonos and then we'll do like the kind of classic Euro right. trip. So I said to my parents, like, I've saved up all my money. I just need, I'll, I'll pay for everything, but I just need permission. And I kind of like didn't tell them about how. I wasn't with them from beginning to end. I was like, I'll just meet up with them in Athens, but I'll begin in Paris. So I essentially like, you know, that was my, I was 16. Yeah. So I like flew 
by myself, went from Paris down, took the train down to the south of Italy, crossed over to Greece, met up with them, like Mykonos, like being in Mykonos, that was like probably the biggest epiphany for me. Because here I was like, grew up in this certain way, even even if like I'd been to clubs in San Francisco that were like great and, you know, like they weren't, it was like back then, like there wasn't like straight clubs, gay clubs. It was, it was like, clubs. it was just clubs. Yeah, yeah. And, and Mykonos was like that vibe, but like on steroids. It was like everybody there. I mean, it was sort of like 1985. So this is this is really before there's any sort of AIDS talk. It's like, it's really like everybody is free, mm-hmm. feeling great and doing whatever they want with no fear. Okay. And so it's an amazing time to be in a place like that, especially if you come from my background and you're like, oh my God, like you can be... You, like it was just so free and open and beautiful and like non judgmental. And it's the, the common thread was like, we're just all here to have a good time. And so it was, you know, for my parents, it would be like Sin City. Like, this is what, <laughs> like, you know, this is Sodom what hell. Yeah, Sodom yeah. and Gomorrah. And I was oh, like, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> Bring it on. This is like my idea of heaven. So that really was like the thing that like clicked. Like, there are people from all over the world who come to a place to just have a good time and like let their freak flag fly. And I'm going to be one of those people. Well, it sounds like though, despite how you were grew up and what you had or didn't have, there's like this underlying confidence that grows and builds from the entire thing. Because e- even then you could have the best life in the world or the worst worst life in the world. There's still a fear of I'm going to leave the country on an airplane at 16. Where where does the confidence come from? Yeah, I don't know where I, I think that's where I think I do have to give I don't I don't know. Like are you are you born with that? Is it that I give my parents the credit for that? Like I don't know. I, I mean for me and I think I don't know, there's not a confidence gene. I don't mm-hmm. know, maybe someone will listen to this and respond. But like maybe that is from your parents. Cause I think the thing that always perplexed me the most is despite people's childhoods of the good and the bad, there's as you get older, you kind of shed and recognize the faults of your parents, but then like be like, oh my God, like whatever happened, like you got all this confidence. Mm-hmm. You you, you know, and drive. Mm-hmm. And like those are things that you, you don't, you know, that they're taught. Their experience. Right, right, right. I mean, I definitely think that there was always a like um a drive to like, you know, my dad was big on compliments and my mom was a very is a very I mean, they're both alive. So they're very loving people. Do they know your all the, the truth now? Yeah, pretty much. I think so. What'd they say? I think that they um pray for me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that they sort of, of course, like, um, I, you know, I basically am like, I, I love that you have faith and my faith is in being a good person. Like, so that's sure. my, that's my way for now. I mean, maybe that will change. They're like, but, oh, I love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. You, you, you already yeah. did it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think that they, um, they probably wish that I was, you know, sort of followed in the, followed their beliefs, but sure. I think that they're, they're fine and yeah. they're, they're happy and proud of what I'm doing. But, um, Clearly. yeah. So, so anyway, confidence. Yeah, I yeah. should give them the credit for that. Well, no, I, I that was not the point. I was not. No, saying but they uh, but the I credit, do think but. it's it's like it, it is it is interesting when you sort of look back. Like when I think about where where did that sort of five year old know that I didn't I, that that wasn't my truth. Like when I'm singing the songs in church and I'm just like, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to say the words or like when people are praying and you like keep your eyes open because that's your form of rebellion. I do the same thing too. Sometimes there's a lot of times where like, yeah, someone's like, we'll sit down. They're like, hey, can I pray? And I'm like, I'm opening my fucking eyes, man. Do yeah. not. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh. Do not put that on me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God. We all have such complications with religion. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> But I, um, yeah, I'm, I mean, it's, I'm not saying this in a condescending way. No, yeah, I'm yeah. very happy for like what people find, like what I was talking to my friend Pilar and telling her about my trip with my parents. And she's like, sometimes I'm so jealous of people's faith. 
Like that's such a, it's such a beautiful thing for them. I wish I could have it. And I'm like, I, I know, but I, I don't, I actually am not jealous. I just, I'm happy for them. Well, everyone has faith. It's just what is, you know, it, I think when people use the, that, that F word, it's mm-hmm. like, in most cases, they're trying to connect that to some form of spirituality. Yeah. But it's like, you, otherwise people just put them, their faith in themselves. Yeah, and, yeah. In most cases, it serves them pretty well. Right. Like, right. you know, I think it's, it's uh, I think it, it comes down to like control. At, mm-hmm. at all times. I mean, I wrestle with that all the time. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, I mean, my, my dad, you know, I've, I've shared this before. My dad was a pastor. I grew up heavily in the church. I moved when I was in New York. I interned at a church out here. No it, way. The church imploded, uh, literally. They, um, I don't know if I've shared this before. I probably have. I remember I, the church was like breaking down and I was out here because they like wanted me to like play music and like sing like church songs and stuff. And I was no like- No way. Yeah. You sing? Oh yeah. I, I moved out here to- play in a band i was like oh I, i'm a failed wannabe rock star oh my god oh yeah yeah it's out there it's yeah okay but uh <laughs> i need to listen to all the back podcast <laughs> no 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 i'm just saying like the music's out there like it was but yeah i mean it's but I, I i was at this church thing and the church was like slowly imploding and here's one thing i would say in most cases whatever religion you were trying to follow generally the people that you dislike the most are is not so much the religion itself it's the followers of the religion who are interpreting their religion, right. placing it upon others, right. whatever that is. Right. And I don't say that to defend. I just say as like people are right. usually the problem. Right. So the church is imploding and they're like, hey, Jeremy, they're like, we'd like to offer you uh, the job to be the, the college youth pastor. No. I'm 19 years old. No. I was like, homie is trying to sleep with college girls right now. You do not want me in this role. And I was like, I'm out. <laughs> No way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And then when did you stop going to church? Uh, I took a hard pause. Um, I think I stopped then for a while. And then I got, to be honest, I got really, really depressed over various things in my life and relationships and people and careers and, you know, and desires of status and income, being around New York and being around all these things that you want but don't have or or we were talking about adjacent, mm-hmm. being adjacent to. Mm-hmm. That's that's my sweet spot. I'm, I'm just just kind of over there Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, had deep depression. And I went, I, I worked for a British company I know this is your podcast, but I'll, I'll tell this story. <laughs> I worked for a British company and I had a really, really bad panic attack on airplane. I'd have like anxiety. I've always had it. And I land early um, in the morning or um, and I went to church at Westminster Abbey and I wanted to like go somewhere to like be alone. And like I had a desire to pray, mm-hmm. but I didn't know exactly what I was praying to. And I also, a part of me was like, I don't want to do whatever my dad did. I'm not a pastor. I don't want to do these things. And I went to Westminster Abbey and I was just moving. Wow. By everything. Like, like, cause also at the time you couldn't go there unless you were, uh, cause it was a Sunday. They're like, you're, you can only come in if you're coming to church. And I was like, eh, yeah, fine. I'm coming to church. And I sat there and I listened to the sermon and it was basically the guy talked about Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. And it was very top mm-hmm. level sort of TED talk mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> style right. sermon, you know, and I remember sitting there and Chaucer's grave wow. is 20 feet from me. And I'm just, but I was surrounded by like the old stuff. And I remember I left and I was crying and, you know, and this is the thing, it's like the, you know, Catholic church or church of England, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and as you're leaving, they're kind of like greeting or saying goodbye to you. And he left me and he, and he was like, son, why are you crying? And it, uh, I wow. was like, and I looked at him and I was like, oh. I don't know. I'm just really anxious, man. And my dad's a pastor. And, da, da, da. and like the dude no. clearly was like, I don't need to know the whole truth. No. But he was kind of just saying goodbye. But um, wow. yeah, he was like, can I pray for you? And it kind of hit me. And I, And I'm not saying that I'm all religious or anything now, but like something in that moment, whether wow. it was energy, whether it was God, whether yeah. whatever it was, made me be like, okay, right. you're, you, you don't seem to be that bad of a guy. Right. And I clearly came there in a moment of desperation and, right. and anger. Right. And it, yeah. And so now, I mean, I, I wow. would say I have, I continue to have an extremely complicated relationship with any form mm-hmm. of religion or spirituality. Mm-hmm. However, I have a deep longing to understand things that are outside of myself. Mm-hmm. Where does the confidence come from? Where does the, mm-hmm. all, all these things where like right. that, you know, like, well, what's the point of even talking to people? Like, right. so that, I think that, that is an underlying thing of how I approach everything. Um, right. so yes, that's a long winded answer there. Wow. Anyway. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, who knows, you know, and, and people have come alongside and said, well, that was God. And I'm like, well, was but it, like, you I know, f- I feel like there are, there, there's that kind of connectivity and 
it's um and i think for some you know there's some commu- deep community or feeling like there's there's something bigger than you yeah and i think that feeling like in that way that it's bigger than you and that you are connected to it not in a it's bigger than you and now it's making me have a worse panic attack but more like i'm actually a part of something and we all have this and that kind of shared pain yeah. i mean that's why thing, people think, when really... they are in recovery and there's yes. this surrender there's right. no what because i think in, in in the 12 steps they talk about higher power you mm-hmm. know and surrendering to your higher power and and the death to your ego and mm-hmm. and um you know, and I think there there's a reason that mm-hmm. you wanted to go back home right. to hang out with your parents, right? Because what well, I mean, if they did such a bad job, fuck that. But at the same time, well, no, <laughs> right, right? right? Because there's something right. there, and I think you know clearly this is not the intention of where I expected us to go in this conversation. But hey, here we are. But like that, I think that's that like never goes away on the um, on the sort of travel front. Yeah. I think that there is something about like that kind of that sort of community and that like finding finding things that sort of reinforce or like there there's something when people are like how did you how do you get into travel or like what's your what's your connection to travel or like what's the the way that I the way that I kind of move through places and I feel like it's it is for me, kind of like my religion, mm-hmm. and I think that there is it's it's not about and when I say travel, it's not like the when I'm going into a city sure. and I'm staying in a fancy hotel because like basically the you know the PR want me to do a cool Instagram story from the hotel or whatever. So that's the that's the real. There's story. a little bit more to that, yeah. but okay. Yeah, no, but like <laughs> I think that. Um, I do think that there's like, there is something in this. Um, I, I was writing the Ed letter for uh, the most recent issue. and Of Yolo Journal. Like, of Yolo Journal. Yeah, and which is your magazine. That's my magazine. Yeah. Yes. We're, we're jumping all over the place <laughs> no, here. No, please. But, this is great. But um, <laughs> so I'm writing this letter and I was like, you know, there's something about, because this was the longest period of time that Matt and I have ever been away Um we we started traveling mid May and came back in late August and um and so we went a lot of places mm-hmm. and we really were never anywhere more than like uh we were at our house in France for maybe like ten days but most of it was like moving all around and so when people are like oh my god I see all the places you went and it was so amazing what's your favorite place and what was the best hotel and the best this and the best that and I'm like you know like the like in that sort of like the the images I have in my brain of like you know what's the what's the movie look like in my in my head of yeah. the summer not the highlights and it's like always the things where it's like um that like swimming in the water with your kid it's the like um sharing a meal with friends that like you um haven't seen in a while or whatever mm-hmm. belly mm-hmm. laughs or like like dancing like a dork with matt and in you know like with the phone inside a, a glass because we don't have a speaker or whatever. It's Aww. like, it's like these things that are so um, not actually about the place. And so I think that the thing that I like the, here's the religion part. I feel like sometimes that the, the, the reason why I like traveling is because there is a becoming the sort of best version of yourself when you are on the road. And then, and then like you, when I'm here in Brooklyn, like I'm just like a robot. I'm just, I'm just working. I'm just doing my thing. I'm like nose, you know, head down, get your shit done. Now it's time to walk the dog. Okay. Now I get to see some friends. That's really fun. I love them. But when I go to Europe, if I'm in that or wherever I am, is it it can be California. It could also be like a place that isn't a home. place that isn't yeah. home. Then I'm I'm all of a sudden like, oh, let's wake up and go for a hike. Or oh my God, like let's let's say yes to everything. And um I'm not going to just like sit there with my laptop open. Like how, 
how much do I like waste time all day with my laptop open, like looking at my Gmail and like deleting like spam instead of like <laughs> doing the thing I should be doing or like going for a walk or. Yeah. So okay. I do think there is something to where when I think about travel, it's often that it puts your head into a different space that then is like a reset. But it, it's like helps me when I come back to my regular life to be more that version of myself. So you're more intentional so, when you're yeah. able, when it's, it, I'm, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but it sounds like when you're leaving home, you're disconnecting a little bit from a routine. Right. Right. My, my the laptop, kind of patterns. The, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then when you're abroad, not, I mean, because here's the thing I would argue in most cases, the culture of New York is so, you know, not bizarro, but so unique, so diverse. So there's everything. But, you know, if you're, if you're in Mykonos, it, that feels like it's a different culture, but it's a deeper yeah. aspect of that. But you get that, you get that reset, right? It's that time again, the time for the old Jer Bears picks from Standard and Strange. You know what I'm talking about. They're one of my favorite clothing stores on earth. With locations in Oakland, Santa Fe, and New York City, they have everything from incredible weather jackets and boots to the highest quality Japanese denim. Look, it's getting a little warm, and I'm loving their new gear from Orslo. But by the way, before I start going crazy, here's a little tip, folks. If you don't have a pair of fatigue pants in your wardrobe, you're just missing out. And pair it with the Western shirt from Standard and Strange, and you're going to unite the world. Okay? This is, I mean, I'm serious, they're great. And look, if you're still thinking, just head over to standardandstrange.com and see why they're one of my favorite shops. I mean, what other retail store donates 2% of their revenue, not profits, to giving back? I love these folks, and so should you. So visit standardandstrange.com to learn more. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for their mailing list so you never miss the latest dope gear they have at standardandstrange.com. That's standardandstrange.com. Look, I'm trying to keep my fits on lock. We're in the stalemate of life between the dress and the casual. Enter the shirt jacket. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's not a traditional sport coat. It's not as thin as a shirt. It's a shirt. It's a jacket. It's a shirt jacket. And the ones that I wear are from proper cloth. My personal favorite shirt jacket is their navy herringbone and linen. Inspired by the iconic French work jacket, it goes great with a t-shirt or one of your own custom shirts from proper cloth. And by the way, it's less than $200. And oh, that linen is crunchy, my friends. Head over to propercloth.com to learn more or listen to their founder, Seth Scarrett's episode on Blammo. Seriously. I love the brand, I love the price, I love everything they offer. And if that's not your speed, I have been wearing their knit polos nonstop. And actually, can I stop for one second? Because the length, the length is perfect. I don't want a polo shirt that's wearing me, I gotta wear it. But maybe you're gonna go full custom and you're gonna schedule yourself an appointment in one of their showrooms or a virtual appointment through a video call. I get it, I get it. They'll make it easy on you and they're gonna work around your schedule. So get your gear this summer and head over to Proper Cloth dot com and check out their new summer collection proper cloth custom clothing made smarter at propercloth.com so is it the people that is driving you or is it like the environment all of the above i think that it's definitely all of the above but i think like what so matt and i took an apartment in rome and we rent i know it sounds really crazy but we rented an How apartment. How hard is that, okay. by the way? So What's it's the not that hard. Here? Like we, well, we have a friend who was like, I really want you guys to move here and I'm going to help you find an apartment. So when we went to Rome, I was like, if you find us an apartment and it's great and it's cheap enough, then um, maybe, okay. maybe. So this so, is an Airbnb. No. So she helps us find, and we go and we look at several apartments and finally we okay. see this one and like you walk in the entrance and it's like a 15th century former palazzo that's now like owned by a family that has then divided it into multiple apartments and it's many mm. different parts of the same family. So they all individually, you know, it's like as, as people pass away, then like their kids, like, you know, maybe they don't live there, but they rent it out. So we rent this apartment. It is the just the stairway going up to it. Was so beautiful. Um, was there and, stuff inside? Uh, yeah, there's a, the apartment. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah, the apartment is furnished. And okay, it's uh, we rent it from this woman who's 85, Flaminia. And she's like this incredibly elegant woman whose husband, I think, was a diplomat. And she speaks like perfect English. And she has this... Um, 
the furniture is really nice. Like that, like we kind of fell into this like beautiful world. The apartment looks right into Cy Twombly's former apartment. So like wow. you, you literally like see if you Google Cy Twombly apartment, like what when you are looking at those photos, we see the backside of those photos, which is so cool. And um it's a great street. It's literally like twenty two hundred dollars a month for a two bedroom, two bath on the best street. It's like living in the West Village in a furnished apartment. Yeah. I mean, you, you're like, how is this possible? Yeah. It's 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 like something that here would be like 15k. Like they're hands down. At least. There's, yeah. yeah. It's incredible. So, we did we took that apartment and we kind of li- just live the life that we would live here in Brooklyn, but we do it there. And when I wake up there, I say like, let's go for a run and then we come back you run, and you then exercise we like together. maybe we wow. go yeah. It's like level yeah. 99 relationship level. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> the ability well, to exercise together with your partner is, uh, cause when you're exercising, you're exerting yourselves and you know, and you're, you're, there's, there can be heavy emotions that get tapped into to exert yourselves. And yeah, I mean, I think because we travel so much, like running is our way of like, like, you guys maybe, run the same yeah, pace. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, I just sort of had to start running because I was like, we overconsume constantly. Like it's a great eraser from uh-huh, the night before. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then, um, and it's a good way to see where you are. So we run every morning and I'll like take Matt on different routes. I've got him. He likes to do the same thing every time. I'm like, no, no, no. We're going to like explore the city, oh, okay. do different different routes. And then when we come back, we'll maybe go to the market and we'll like you know, get flowers. And we do all these things that feel like daily things that you would do. I mean, maybe like the market we go to is a little more touristy. It's Campo de Fiori. And yeah, maybe yeah. like that's more like our friends would probably not go to that place, but it's still charming. So we do. Yeah. And then like, you know, we'll have lunch. Matt drinks wine at lunch. I don't do that. I'm like, we can't be on hol. We're not on holiday now. We're actually living well, here. It's kind of hard <laughs> Yeah. Separate that yeah. for sure. But yeah. um but anyway, so we have this like better like living more richly, living more intentionally and thoughtfully and like enjoying our life whereas somehow and even though New York for many people would be that Rome, mm-hmm. like I needed mm-hmm. to go somewhere else to figure out that like that's it's not about Rome. It's about me. And somehow, like in being in France, where it's a very, because we have that house that we redid in France, being, um, I realize that sounds very douchey. Well, you can unpack but, that a tiny yeah. bit. Because yeah. from what I hear, it was also a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, that was that was basically like Matt's and my fantasy of having a, a home that we owned, European home ownership. That was in 2015, we Buy a had house these for a Euro um, friends. Sort of thing. Yeah, it was a little bit like that. Sure. Two tiny little houses that were, you know, I mean, we we got them for a song. And of course, like every renovation, it's like, so there's no way you can buy a house, no matter how cheap it is, and not it, it's like everything costs you, gotta use you their, at their least. Folks too, it, right? uh, yeah, I think that it's called a cartel. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. how it is in Italy, where yeah. like the village that my grandfather was from. It's like come get a house for a euro, but you need to use all of our folks, oh, yeah, and yeah, this yeah, is yeah. what it's going to cost. Exactly. You're like, oh, hey. yeah, exactly. But um, so that was like a. Three, four, I think it took us like three years and then another year and a half to like get the pool in and all of that. So no, that house is actually perfectly up and running and we can enjoy it and like all of the- you, Are you renting are, it out? We haven't started to rent it out. We, we rented it out before it had the pool and then, and now it's like that thing where it's like, we have to set up the systems. Like we have two, you know, where you have like too many things that are personal that then you don't want to rent it out. But I'm like, I'm, I just, we have to get organized. Once we're organized, sure. then we can rent it out. Okay. Because I do want people to experience this little village and this house. Where, where and is I it? Want, so it's near Bordeaux. It's okay. like you fly or train into Bordeaux and then it's in the wine country that is about an hour above Bordeaux. Okay. So it's um, it's wine country that also has the um, the Atlantic Ocean. So you have these like 
beautiful beaches. If you're a surfer or a strong swimmer, it's not like, it's not Mediterranean swimming, it's ocean swimming. And, but like, it's beautiful. Wow. And then you're, you know, you're like super close to Ile de Re or to Cognac or, I mean, Bordeaux is amazing or Cap Ferret, like it's three hour drive to Biarritz. Um, it's kind of perfect. I love it. Um, but that is, um, that is a place that like, I couldn't compare my life in New York to that because it was, it's sort of like city life to sleepy country life. But if you go, if you compare city life of New York to city life of Rome and you realize like, okay, yeah, sure. Like there are things that are very different from Rome to New York, but it's, I act differently. So I have to get out of my own way and stop like saying it's Brooklyn. Brooklyn's no, no, it's me and how I how am how I act within this place that I have to shift. It's not that Rome changes me. It's that I just I'm just acting differently. You oh, know, wow. so it's like less about the place. Like I and that's the part that I think I'm trying to maybe like you're a preacher's kid and I'm almost a preacher's kid. And like what we're actually trying to do is is preach. <laughs> but <laughs> perhaps but I do think that in this travel space. It's like getting people out of the, like, I need to go on vacation and then like life is better when you're traveling. It's like, it, yes, it is important to do those things. It's important to like not work and to go swimming. And that could be a swimming hole that's five miles from where you live. It doesn't have to be that it's the Amalfi Coast, but like it's what, it's learning how to kind of figure out the the thing that is Actually, maybe I'm just like way overthinking. No, my that, I mean, I think, I like, think you're onto something there because any place you go to, like, uh, I think people put a lot of weight and expectations on a vacation mm -hmm. or a different destination. And I think then if it doesn't go right, they want to blame, well, you know what? But the bed was yeah. really crappy. And yeah. you know what? The key didn't work yeah. or the food was this. Right. And it's like, but that happens everywhere. And there's, right. there's a, there's a, people put experiences in these trips, like on pedestals of yeah. perfectionism, mm -hmm. which also ends up making, at least from people that I have met in my own experience, you, you don't even ever get to enjoy it because you had such like, but life exists everywhere. Right. So there's going to be errors. Right. There's going to be a mistake here, you know, right. even if you're at the four seasons or right. wherever yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. No, like I, I get a lot of uh, messages from people that are like, uh, if you didn't go, if you haven't been to the Pelicano in Italy, like then you kind of are a loser. And I'm like, where did this come wow. from? Where did this mythology come uh, from? The like, internet, you know, I guess. It's, I don't and know. I'm like, <laughs> okay, like let's just break it down. Like here's a here's a hotel yeah. that is on the sea. There are a lot of hotels on the sea. Like they have yellow and white towels. Okay, there are a lot of places. Like you yeah, could they're, buy they're a brand yeah, and a hotel. And you can basically yeah. like buy those towels also from their website, Isimo. So, <laughs> you know, you can kind of make your own thing. Yeah. And it's like, like it has 50 rooms. It's like people have been going there for 50 plus years. Like there's still old timers that go there and book it out for three weeks in a row. And they like drive their cars down from Germany and France. And so it has like this kind of, it does have this, like, I, I love a place that still gets the old timers. Mm -hmm. um, and it has a great bartender. And yes, the views are, there. there is a lot that's so special about it. But because it has 50 rooms and so many people want to go, it's outrageously expensive. And it's also next to impossible to get into. So like, how about like not thinking about that is the only place and like st unfollow or mute the people who are like putting up the pictures of it and like <laughs> find somewhere else that actually suits your budget and is like, it, I mean, you don't have to go to even Italy to have that. But I mean, you can literally make an incredible spritz watch Matt's on Instagram on oh, how yeah. to, no, yeah. no, you know what I mean? It's like, I just, I get so, um, I get so I'm, it makes me bummed out for, for this kind of thing. It's like the, the hotel is the new handbag. It's like your experience at like, if you've been at that place, 
then it's sort of like the uh, it's the Kelly bag or it's whatever the Birkin or it's the new Prada, blah, 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 or whatever. And that's the part where it's like, okay, now experiences, we used to just call them like, it, it seemed like travel bucket list people were older people. And then at a certain point with Instagram, like the bucket list became something that maybe it was not just because of Instagram, well, Instagram but you know, younger people were like, you, you right. Couldn't- immediately share in real time the experiences that you were having. Right, right. So it's so. like now people are, um, you know, there's a lot of bragging rights that happen with going to different places. But I do think that like it also has made it so that when you see one place over and over, mm-hmm. it becomes like, oh, that's a, um, that's, that's yeah. the place. You know, I, I had a chat with a friend the other day and she was like, oh, there's this one hotel that she sees a lot on my Instagram and she's like, I know that that's going to be worth it. And I said, listen, I'm really good friends with the owners. I go there because I'm friends with them. I don't think you should spend your money there. And I let me save you from doing that. And I hope that my, like, I, I try to always say like, I'm here to see my friends, not yeah, like yeah, yeah. I'm here because I'm spending thousands of dollars a night to be here. And so I do think there, it, it's like, I want to kind of like unpack this travel, um, this, this sort of like travel anxiety. It's like already people are like, oh, I just need to, I need to go away. I need, or like we're planning our family trip or like I need a weekend getaway or I need a romantic blah, blah, blah. All of the things that people, you know, are like, just tell me where I should go for the X, Y, and Z. And it's like, then once they start talking, they already have like a million ideas in their head. It's sort of like fashion. Like everybody knows that you can't just say to somebody yeah. like, tell me how I should dress. Right? Yeah. It's like, well, I mean, you're, you are dressed like what is it that you don't like about what you're wearing? Like, wh- what is, what are your, and, and you know how like complicated that, that question would be. And most people wouldn't say that. They'd be like, I need a new fall coat. And that's where you're like, I can help you with that. What do you I... already have in your closet? What is like, would it be redundant if you had this coat from Drake's? Or would you like, you know, have you seen the new blah, blah, blah? Or, right. or like, and so, but somehow with travel, there isn't that like lexicon that we all feel feel comfortable with like I'm with watches with style like, people are just like I need to go away <laughs> like great how long how much money blah like they they it's like there isn't this kind of com- they don't feel comfortable with the language where it's where they know how to kind of give you a starting point so yeah it's, it, and so I think in a way that's where I'm like let's figure out like what do you really need from this trip start with like what are you really looking for um, because really maybe you don't need to spend like money that you don't have and go into debt. Maybe you should just like go away for the weekend somewhere um, and maybe it's like if it's like I need luxury, I need to be pampered. Mm. Maybe you just like even go somewhere. I mean, I will never outside of this use the word staycation, but like it can be that like spoil yourself. Don't take a flight. Like just like don't leave. I, I was talking to this guy um, uh, who was going to go stay at the Amon in New York, and um, and he said, um, you know, I I know that it's going to be weird. I know it's not going to be perfect. Um, and I'm not going to leave it. I'm only going to stay in the Amon because it's like thirty two hundred a night. Yeah. He's like, Jeez. we're going to eat dinner there. We're going to eat every single thing. We're going to do spa treatments. We are not leaving because I just want to be in that cocoon. And even if it's mediocre, like the point is to spend one night there and just like immerse myself in it. And I was like, that's a pretty good idea. If you, if you want to drop yeah. the money, I mean, if you think about how much it would cost for the flights and all the restaurants you go to and like the getting there and your time it takes to travel and all that stuff, like if you want to just go and drop stupid money to spoil yourself for one night in a place and don't leave and get the room service. Like that's also another, you know, it's like thinking about what do you need from this? Why are you even saying I need to go on a trip or? Yeah. I mean, cause you touched on a few different things. I think there's a stigma of travel and status and luxury that, you know, people want, 
but there's also, I mean, you're kind of getting a little bit spiritual here where and you're like, look, you know, one, like when you, when you put all of your, I don't know, all, all of your joy in, in that specific experience or what that is, mm-hmm. like it may not serve you that well, you know? And, and I think that's, that's really true. Cause I think a lot of people think like, oh, trips or stuff like that. It's only mm-hmm. just for the richest people and I'll never have these means. Or I'll never do that when it's like, yeah, but you can still, you know, my mm-hmm. wife likes to take like me days. <laughs> Which like, she's just like, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to leave and I will be back at this time. And she'll like go and, you know, just somewhere and just write in a journal and just disconnect. And like, she has the ability to really disconnect where it's like, phone's off, this is, you know, or like the notifications are off or all these sorts of things. And like, that's her little trip. And like, she'll kind of almost like, I don't know if you ever watched Twin Peaks when Mm -hmm. like uh, Kyle MacLachlan's like talking to, Mm -hmm. you know, the woman at the coffee shop. He's like, just like, give yourself like one thing every day. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, because otherwise I think people, you just put so much stock in these vacations or experiences. That's like, well, I'm never going to have the money. Well, it's like, sure. I will never have the money to go somewhere and spend like 10 grand a night on some like wild butler service and private jets. Mm -hmm. And those are like, cool, but I can still go do, I could still go have some me time or I could still go sit at a nice restaurant and or a nice bottle of wine or whatever. And I think that trying to break that down, this like all or nothing mentality that a lot of people have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when I'm going from being in Europe and then going out to California sort of shortly after and spending time in upstate and then just like being on hikes and like, um, I mean, literally like seeing flowers and this sort of like wild flowers. And like, mm-hmm. I'm always, oh, I know what I was going to say. Like when I was visiting my parents, we went, we went on a hike in um, Olympic National mm-hmm. uh, Park. And right next to it is this lake called Lake Cushman. And I'd never heard of it. I've never been to this part of the park because it's so huge. So this was a new a, a new walk for us. So I see I see like as we're driving out, it's sort of like afternoon and the lake has like this beautiful rock and there are people jumping off the rock and the way that the light is hitting, it's like total that dappled mm-hmm. light. The people on the rock are all backlit. So you can't tell what anybody's wearing or like what they look like or, you know, um, I was like, I, I got to pull over. I got to, I got to get this picture. And I was like, the way that like the sound of them laughing as they jumped and whatever, it was like, it was like better than Lake Como. It was literally like a moment that where I've documented it, like, oh my God, like Lake Como and these kids jumping off this beautiful bridge. And it was so like out of like, call me by your name. And (laughs) and this was like, call me by your name, but like the Washington state version. And it was just so pretty to see like, and, and like, it was like, those people have no idea that like, I'm looking at them and thinking they look as good as the Italians look, (laughs) but they do, you know? And like, and that's the part where I think, like I feel so lucky. I mean, there are a million places I haven't been, but I feel so lucky that I've been around the world. And I, I, I. <laughs> uh, no, it's like I, I can say that you can find that if you just like let, if you allow yourself, and you're not, and you aren't. I think the biggest problem is like we can't see what's under our own nose and appreciate it when we are so want to try the other thing. Yes. Let me say I've tried the other thing and it is good, but we also have very good here too. And that's the part like if I can like take stress away where it's like you don't have to go to the Pelicano. I swear to God, you don't. I've been there. I love them. It's really great, but there are a million great places. So like get out of that. Like I've got to go to X, Y, and Z that I've seen a million times. Like you don't have to take the Orient Express. You don't ever have to Uh-oh, do that. Oh, I feel it's, seen. Do you feel seen? <laughs> yeah, that's always been a thing is I want to go on the Orient Express, you know, which is like, why? I, I want to sit in a, in a Four Seasons train car. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, it's because I like Poirot. <laughs> So you could, um, you should go to Istanbul and, um, and you can like stay in the hotel that like they, um, have you ever been to no, Istanbul? That is a I've great been to a couple city. places that are cool and that's it. And I tend to go back to, I'm a creature of habit. Too. Cause I'm like, well, if I go to Istanbul, like I, I need to make sure that I can do this and I want to be like, I am an, a ball of nerves. And so it's like, it takes a lot for me to have the new experience, but if I have it and I like it, I right. just do that over and over again. And I recognize right. that's a fault, but like, it's just, I don't think it's a fault. I think it's just knowing. Yeah, I'm like, I can knowing, go to this hotel. Like I can stay here. I can with. do this. I can sit in this same seat on the plane that I fly. Like I like to even buy the get the same seat. I love that. 
it's well, I, yeah. I, I feel like I'm I, making I excuses that. for my anxiety, but it is. There's like no, but when I sit in that seat, I always get this view when I fly in, and da, oh, da, da. that is so good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had never been to Istanbul and I think why I hadn't been until this year was because I was like, I don't want to go to a city that I want to experience on a really deep way, mm-hmm. or at least deep for me as a first timer. And I don't have any friends there. So why am I going to go someplace like, and just follow a guidebook? Like I need, I need to feel like, like I'm the guidebook. I, yeah. <laughs> but I was like, I'll just keep going back to play places where or to new places where but where somebody is like hey I am from here and I want to show you the ropes so when my friend Mina um, who I met earlier in the year was like come to Istanbul and then we'll go to Bodrum I was like great and then from there then you end up making tons of friends and so like that's that's a little bit like the premise of my of my black books and what I do try and do in the in the newsletter is say like I want to be the friend that I'm looking for <laughs> so like if people, are trying to figure out like like I would hope that you would say I think I could go to Istanbul because like I know that this is where Yo and Matt went and then like all of their friends and what they loved and of course I would give you like the sort of like yeah. edited version of that but I think that that's the thing that I'm trying to do when I'm giving it's like so you're hitting the road here are these places I'm certainly no authority I can't know the ins and outs of all these places like places change all the time sure. so it's like I do these black books I ask everybody I know um, from shopkeepers I've met to like friends or friends of friends or restaurant people whatever the way that you would like literally if you're coming to whatever city you haven't been to in a while, like text your friends that you know, know, and say like, hey, what should I hit up this time? Yeah, and that yeah. that's the thing where like, I feel like that's the point of a newsletter versus a magazine. Magazine is like pretty, should inspire you, should feel like the book version of... Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Um, the newsletters you know, always feel more current. You yeah, know. current. And then like we, uh, like I go back in and if I've been back to Edinburgh, I'm like, yeah, that restaurant wasn't so good. Or like <laughs> there's like uh, on the second visit or like there's a new hotel or, you know, where oh, I always like update it so yeah. that it feels like that thing that, you know, I'm not going to do like um, a simple black book like every year, but I will update it. But like it should have that feeling where you're like, you'll, where you could be like, I'm back in New York. Where do I eat this time? And right. there's like five new restaurants that you should check out. So, you know, like it, it is going to grow. I'd like to ultimately, um, have it be much more like a, not just on Substack, like, sorry. Well, <laughs> but, no, know. I mean, I think, well, yeah, because in, in most cases, Substack is, is like a minimum viable brand experience for whomever is producing that content, right? Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a good way, because it, mm-hmm. it, you can you can get the essence of what you're trying to communicate, but also for what you're, you know, kind of discussing in terms of packaging these things together, the ability to go and update it. A newsletter a week ago, I don't even really want to read. Yeah. So if I didn't read it at that time, I, right. you know, I miss it. So it's like, well, if I can go and I say, hey, I'm going to, you know, Lake Como, where, where do I go? Or I'm going to Italy or I'm mm-hmm. going to these things. You know, because I think it's interesting because the concept of a travel guide is obviously not new in any way, but I've looked through all of your stuff and there's a lot of places you recommend that I don't see recommended anywhere else. Mm-hmm. And I am kind of like, what, what's the secret sauce? You know, I mean, I'm not trying to get you to reveal everything, but just like there's I, at least the stuff I've seen, it's all feels much more genuine than maybe this is from what you've experienced in your previous career in publishing. But like generally the stuff that I would always get recommended is like just Lux, you know, mm-hmm. where you're like, hey, mm-hmm. this is a little place. And right. this is a, you know, it's, it's it, this different, it might still be luxury, but it's still this different understanding of luxury. Right. You know, there's community in it, right? Right. I think that the the problem with the way that most magazine editors get their information is that usually it, it comes from a publicist. So oh. if you've already got like the money to have a publicist, you're right. probably a hotel that's on a certain level, right? So it's right. probably already going to be in luxury world. So, you know, there's obviously like the sort of advertising based model that are most magazines Mm -hmm. and and then there's the the sort of publicist kind of mafia where Mm -hmm. they you know the it's 
It's like they may have a new hotel that maybe isn't like even close to being an advertiser, but like you want to keep that publicist happy. So then you're going to do something about that hotel. And so ultimately like, and then they're, you know, this is back when I was at Traveler. They're also giving the same information to travel and leisure and to departures and whatever other, I don't know, food and wine, whatever. Sure, like yeah. everybody's sort of getting the same press release. And so what I always felt like was what about the the little guy who doesn't have a publicist and only has like three rooms above their like cool little restaurant in the right. Amalfi Coast and it's like 100, 125 bucks a night. Like that is actually what you want and what I want, yeah. but it might be on... If you could find it on Google, it's like on page 432, (laughs) you know? And so like, nobody's going to write about that. And then often the people who will tell you about it will say like, you can't tell anybody about this. You know, like, great. Okay. But like, that's kind of like... I, I want the little guy with the three rooms above, you know, the fish shack to, to do well and to be there for forever. And if we don't talk about it, then like, nobody's going to know. And then they yeah. might like... You're going to get another publicist yeah. thing. <laughs> or like their kids don't want to take it on because they don't see any cool people here or, you know, like, so what's the next gen? And so I think the thing that I'm trying to do with the newsletter is to get people, I mean, first of all, I, I will, I will reveal my secrets. I just do. Like, I just feel like it's selfish to not tell people when you find things like maybe I'll book the hotel for the nights that I want before I put it up. Well, that's, but I'm usually not. I think you deserve that. That's fair. Yeah. But <laughs> I I feel like there is, you know, that's the thing. Like, there's a paywall. Like, I, I won't put the stuff that's really, like, going to be impossible to get into because it's so small. I won't put those things on the kind of free newsletter. Because sure. I'm like, you know, I, there's a lot of great stuff in the free newsletter. But, like, the stuff, some of that stuff has to go paywall because it takes a lot of work to get there. And well, like, yeah. I mean, despite the uh, Instagram story and pictures, it sounds like yeah. you, you spend quite a bit of time behind the laptop. <laughs> Yes, exactly. So you're working. I get it. I'm working. And and then the other thing is like the places that are fancy and have the publicists, like they, like often you get to stay in those places for next to nothing or it's calm. The place that's like the small little find are the ones that you're spending the money on, right? So like you are, I am paying to go to these places. And so, um, because you can't, I mean, you, you just can't like ask a small business to be comping your stay. Right. Anyway, so I think that um, it is, it's an interesting different model where I would rather not make money from having luxury brands advertising on YOLO because they think that they're getting luxury eyeballs. I would rather have like a 19 year old who has cool style say like, I found a really, I went on that hike you recommended and like it changed my life. Or like I stayed at that tiny little hotel for like 90 euros and it was epic. Like I'd rather have, and and that's like 80 year olds too. Mm -hmm. Like there's, you know, there are people who have means that have means because they don't spend $10,000 a night having butler service, you know? So it's, it's like the media that we, what we see often on Instagram and if Instagram is the new kind of Condé Nast traveler and travel and leisure, even though they still exist, like how many of us, you go to your dentist office, like, once, maybe twice a year. Mm-hmm. So if you're not subscribing, where are you yeah, seeing that? Right. So so you are seeing it on various, you're seeing this kind of luxury travel content primarily on your Instagram. And so in the same way, like they basically, those luxury companies have just moved their kind of like their um, marketing budgets from the magazine editors over to the Instagram editors let's right. say. And so when you see all of that luxury stuff there, yes, you're getting a really good bird's eye of like these beautiful places. But know that most of those people, myself included, get to stay there because they have marketing budgets. So, you know, it's not because they are the only places that you right. should go. So that's what I think is just like an important differentiating thing. It's like, we all know that like, 
when you see people at fashion shows, like that's, those are done to build up in excitement and um, to get you to want to buy those things. And that's marketing budgets, right? Yeah. There, I mean, there's an event coming up in, uh, surprisingly, in Egypt soon. And the big thing they're doing is they're flying everyone out, you know? And it's like, I don't right. know many people who are like, hey, wh- what are you doing? Let's go to a fashion show. Where? Uh, Egypt. Cool. Who's going to fly us out there? Oh, we have to do it ourselves. Like, they're not going to go. Right. I mean, and so all those, you know, right. you bring the people there. Right. I, and I, I think, thankfully, there's a, this, like, transparency is, like, becoming really cool. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> to where people are now being like, yeah, this is this is how it works. Like, right. This is how the sausage is made. And, right. And it's, it's kind of nice and refreshing. Yeah, I think it's great because I think, like, when you don't have that transparency, it sort of makes people feel like they're really the have-nots. And it's mm-hmm. like, actually, the have part of me is so much of it is work, right. you know? So, like, it's not that there's the, the you've made it and then the losers, right. you know? And I think that it's like so much of what we see, there's so many people are have a terrible relationship with social media where they're like, they hate it so much because it makes them feel terrible, but they can't stop. Yeah. Like, you just need to get off that. I think that's the definition yeah. of an addiction as well. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> I, I, I suffer from this. Yeah, yeah. But, I, but I think that that thing of like fi- helping people figure out like you don't need that handbag, you can have a different handbag or like you can buy that used, it's, it's way cheaper. I yeah. mean, obviously like there's a whole other new business that's out there with secondary market. But, but I think like, that's the thing is like, how do you, um, I just, I just wish that there were more people in this kind of travel space, like talking about travel, like how many fashion editors are there? There's like a gazillion How many people are talking about watches and style and food and And it's like Mm -hmm. somehow with travel, like it's just sort of like this, like, where are they? You know? That's a good point. You're right. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, I think, who have great points of view on travel end up opening up like their own sort of like travel agency where they like, they have great ideas and then they book your trip for you. I just think, I think that that's the, that's the easiest route to monetization. But for me, it's like, I think that that's really hard because I I don't ever want to book people's trips. Well, and you're kind of, now you're an admin, you know, it's like you're not being paid for your taste anymore. You're being paid for paperwork and babysitting. Yeah. And seating arrangements and things like that. You know? Yeah. I I don't want to, I wouldn't want to do that either. No. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I do think it's a, it's something that is so important to people. It's such like a, it's a, like, it's such a goal. It's such a, it's such a want. Uh, and, and I just think that like, it's weird to me. Like I want, it would be when people are like, well, what else, like, who else do you recommend that we talk to about travel? And I'm like, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Like I, I like I, I feel like th- I find yeah. them on Instagram. You know, I find I think that there are people who I follow their travels, but like you kind of want there to be like more travel editors out there who just love talking about travel. So we can actually like start like blanketing the the globe. <laughs> yeah. Of of People with uh, yeah. travel tastes and experiences. Yeah, but, you know, maybe I'll just become the YOLO empire and I'll just do that. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine with that. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Wanda. you. This was a pleasure. So great. Yeah. Let's go on the road. I know. <laughs> I'll see you. Bye. You've been listening to Blamo. We're edited by Amar Lal, our music by Breakmaster Cylinder, and we're produced by Blamo Media. If you like the show, tell a friend. Give us some good vibes. You can follow us on social media at Blamo Podcast or send us an email at info at And if you want even more Blamo, you can join us over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Blamo, where we have tons of exclusive episodes, our exclusive shows. Now, geez, Louise, we got Blamo Presents Derek Guy. We got the Triple J Show with John Moy and Gene Delian. All the good stuff over there and our amazing Slack community. All right, folks, that's it. See you soon.